Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to another episode of the Beard Book Club. I'm your host, Trey. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, before you all get too excited and just start blowing up the chat and everything, just wanted to let you know this week's episode is pre recorded. Hello from the distant past. Um, yes. <laughs> um,. The Price has had a, uh, a church event we had to go to this evening, so we went ahead and pre-recorded. But that doesn't mean that you guys can't still chat and enjoy each other's company while I am reading along to you. I just will not be responding or reacting to anything because this is pre-recorded. Um, heck, knowing future Trey, he's going to be at this event, but still checking his phone and looking at the stream and make sure it's okay. So he'll probably be chatting in about this time here. He's probably already talking right now, talking about how handsome I am. But that's okay. That's okay. But you guys feel free to chat and continue your conversation as well as we are reading through here. Uh, a couple of things before we get started. The usual stuff. First of all, uh, welcome to any new subscribers. I know we got a few more this week. Welcome. The way it works is that when we do these live shows is normally I'm reading and we are having a good time and having conversation. Feel free to chime in. But... Uh, whether you're new or have been around for a while, if you haven't done this already, please do us a big favor and subscribe to the channel. Subscribing really helps us out with the YouTube algorithm, and make sure you turn on notifications as well. Oh, and also, I don't I don't normally plug this, but to any and everybody, whenever you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, please, because that really helps as well, getting us into the algorithm and getting our videos out there, and thus exposing us, not exposing us, that's a bad choice of words, but getting us out there and seen by more people and hopefully they will become members of the book club as well so um if you would like to support bearded book club you could do so in two ways right now you could go to patreon.com slash bearded book club and become a patron the patreon supports us on a monthly basis we've got everything from a dollar tier up to whatever you want to pay tier um and you get some cool perks from each one of those most notably no matter what tier you get you get a big thank you every live show i should do this every time every live show uh so a big thank you to all of our patrons mc be a light productions keith jamie caitlin and melissa Parrish at country financial insurance thank you all for your continued support you can also down in the description of this video guys and all of our stuff you should see a link to a amazon wish list this is the um other way you can support bearded book club you go to that wish list find a book send it to us one way or another that book's going to get read we just wrapped up um the shadow and bone trilogy our good friend caitlin sent us that and so we read them all um sometimes the books you send us get picked for the live shows like this one um, but sometimes they don't either way it's going to get read but you can make a one-time donation in the form of a book if something you want to send us is not on that list tell us and we'll put it on there and then you can send it to us and that is a great way to help us continue to expand this super realistic looking library behind me um the other thing i've got for you this week is the tea of the week i rolled and we got pantenger jinmacha i probably butcher it i butcher it every time it comes up but this is one of my least favorite teas because it is super green tea -y and it uh put it to you this way i'm only supposed to steep this stuff for like two minutes tops you know anyway in the chat whoever's there especially future trey can i get a hashtag pinkies out i think i put enough honey in it to where it's okay it's actually quite nice and i probably finally brewed it correctly when I first got this tea, I was so used to just doing like all the other like English and uh, European teas that I always have. Just throw it in some hot water, let it steep for like five plus minutes, just however you want it, and then go from there. But this stuff, this is from the Far East, maybe. Um, but anyway, it's 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 green tea, loose leaf green tea, and it is hardcore you do not need to steep this stuff for long so if you've got green teas and you're like oh they're just so strong i don't like the way they taste steep it less see what happens you'd be surprised all right guys so all of that out of the way thank you so much for hanging in there for all of that stuff let's see how much we can get read from red rising if you see over here um this is currently what we're reading red rising by pierce brown the bookworms you guys wanted to read this book and i am thoroughly enjoying it i am very glad that it was suggested to us um
Check one, two. Oh, no. I accidentally pulled the, the cord out of the microphone. I need to calm down. <laughs> All right. I accidentally unplugged the microphone, so sorry about that. But here we are. We're back. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yes, I'm thoroughly enjoying Red Rising. Um, we're actually getting towards the end of this book, which means, guys, coming up before too long in the next, I would say, month or so, we're going to have a choosing. And the choosing is how we choose a book. We do a live show. Anyone and everyone that is um, a member of this community can get in here and vote and decide what book we're going to read next. It's tournament style. It's, it's a, whole, a whole bunch of fun. I recommend you be there and so what you can help us do is if you've got suggestions for the next choosing you got a book you really want to read you can start campaigning for it in the comments or in the chat right now go ahead and just give us give us your uh, your suggestions and we will weigh all of those we can't promise everything will get in there but we've already got two or three ready to go so yeah go ahead and give us your suggestions for the choosing but this is what we're reading right now this is currently where we're at chapter 36 a second test let's see what we can get read this week in order to have an army i must be able to feed it so i will take the ovens of ceres that jupiter and mars both lust over the new members of our band from house minerva find it perfectly reasonable to accept my authority I don't fool myself. Yes, they were impressed by me hiding my howlers inside dead horses months ago, and they remember me defeating Pax, but it's only because Mustang trusts me that they obey. We leave those of House Diana as slaves for now. I need to earn their trust. Tactus, oddly, is the only one who seems to trust me. Then again, the laconic youth was all smiles when I told him I'd be sewing him inside of a dead horse over a month ago. There were two more of Diana that I sewed away. The others call them, call them the dead horses, and they each wear braids of white horse hair. I think they're a bit mental. If there is anything in the woods and highlands, it's an, odd, it's an abundance of wolves. We hunt them to train our new recruits in my way of fighting. No glamorous cavalry charges, no lances, and certainly no stupid rules of engagement. Everyone gets cloaks, which are smelly things, as they dry and we peel away the rot everyone except Pax. They haven't yet made a wolf big enough for him. How Ceres is no stranger to siege, Mustang says. She's right. At night they seem to have more soldiers awake than in the day. They watch for sneak assaults. Blazing bundles of tinder light the base of their walls at night. Somehow they have dogs now. Those prowl the battlements. The way from the water is guarded ever since I tried sending Severo in through the latrines long ago during a sneak attack I arranged when we were at war with Minerva. We barely, he barely forgave me for that one. The Ceres students came out no longer. They learn the risk of battling stronger houses on open ground. They'll hole up for the winter and when the cold and the hunger has weakened the other houses, they'll emerge from their fortress in the spring, strong, prepared, and organized but they'll never make it to the spring. So we attack during the day, Mustang guesses. Naturally, I say. Sometimes I wonder why we even bother speaking. She knows my thoughts, even the mad ones. This idea is an especially mad one. We practiced it in a clearing in the north woods for a whole day after flattening out the wood with axes. Pax makes the plan possible. We hold competitions to see who has the best balance in the wood. Mustang wins. Horse face... Milia is second, and she's spitting bitter that she doesn't beat Mustang. I'm third. As we did when springing the trap on House Mars, we sneak as close as we dare the night before and bury ourselves in the deep snow. Again, Mustang and I pair off, huddling tight with one another under the snow. Tactus tries pairing with Milia, but she tells him to go slag himself. If you look at it properly, I was trying to do you a favor, he muttered over at Milia as he huddles down under Pax's smelly armpit. You're about as pretty as a gargoyle's wart, so w when else would you get a chance to snuggle with the likes of me, ungrateful sow? Mustang and the other girls snort their derision. Then the quiet of night and the chill of the open ice plain bites into us and we grow silent. Come morning, Mustang and I shiver into one another and a new snowfall threatens to ruin our plan burying us even deeper in the plain, but the wind is manageable and the flakes do not bury us too deep as they spin through the air. 
I'm first up, though I do not move. And soon after I yawn away the last vestige of sleep, my army wakes organically, one student stirring and grumbling into another till there's a snake of snifting and coughing golds buried together in a shallow tunnel beneath the snow's surface. I can't see them, but I hear their waking despite the sound of the storm wind, so, snowstorm's wind. Ice formed around me in the night outside my thick cloaks. Mustang's hands are inside my pelts, warm against my side. Her breath hits my neck. As I stir, she yawns and straightens, pulling a little away as she stretches, cat-like under the snow. Snow crumbles in between us. Gory hell, this is miserable, Dax, Milia's companion mutters. I can't see him in our snow tunnel. Mustang nudges me. We can barely see Tactus curled into the hollow of Pax's armpit. The two men snuggle together and wake like lovers, only to flinch away from one another when their ice-crusted eyelids flutter open. Wonder which is Romeo, Mustang whispers, her throat raspy. I chuckle and carve a hole in the roof of our tunnel to see that my band of 24 is alone in the plains except for early morning horse scouts in the distance. They will not be a problem. Wind rolls in from the North River, biting deep into my face. You ready for this? Mustang asks me with a grin as I bring my head back into our shelter. Or are you too cold? I was colder in the lock when I first tricked you, I say, smiling. Ah, the old days. All part of my master plan to win your trust, little man, she smirks mischievously. She sees the worry in my eyes, so she grips my thigh and comes close to the others so the others can't hear. Think I'd be squatting here with you in the snow if this plan could go belly up? Negative. But I'm freezing and the wind is dying, so let's go, Reaper. I give the countdown and we're up, snow crumbling around us, wind stinging our faces, and sprinting the hundred meters across the plains to the walls. All 24 of us, silent again, the wind comes and fits. We carry the long tree between us, huddling tight to it as we did in the night when it shared our tunnel with us. It's heavy, but we're 24 and Pax's parents gave him the genes to knock over horses. Panting, legs burning, gritting as the wood weighs down on shoulders in the deep snow. It's a trudge, a shout comes from the wall. A lonely, hollow call that echoes over the still morning winter morning. More shouts, still few, barks, confusion. An arrow whistles past, then another. It's amazing how quiet the world is as the arrow sail, carrying death. The wind has faded again. Sun peaks from behind a cloud layer, and we're bathed with morning warmth. We're at the wall. Shouts spread beyond the stone fortifications from their towers. A signal horn, barking of dogs. Snow falls from the parapets as archers lean over the stone battlements. An arrow shivers in the wood by my hand. Someone goes down, bloody like Dax. Then Pax roars the word and he, Tactus, and five more of our strongest take the long wood beam we cut from the tree trunk and shove the tip as hard as they can into the wall. They hold it there at an angle. They are roaring from the burden. It's still five meters short of the top of the wall, but it's already sprinting up the thin slope. Pax grunts like a boar as he heaves against the angled strain. He's shouting, roaring. Mustang is right behind me, then Milia. I almost slip. My balance and Helldiver hands keep me scrambling up the knotted wood. In our fur, we look like squirrels, not wolves. An arrow hisses through my cloak. I'm against the wall at the top of the wobbling beam, Pax and his boys roaring gutturally from the exertion. Mustang is coming. I cut my hands. She stirrups her foot at the run, and I hurl her up the last five meters to clear the battlements. Her sword slashes, and she screams like a banshee. Then Milia launches the same way off my hands, and the rope she has tied to her waist dangles after her. She anchors up top as I use it to pull myself up the last five meters. The wooden beam crashes to the ground behind me. My sword is out. It's mayhem. How Ceres has ca was caught unaware. They've never had an enemy on the battlements, and there are three of us, screaming and slashing. Rage and excitement fill me, and I begin my dance. They only have bows. It's been months since they've used swords. Ours aren't sharp or fused with electricity, but cold durosteel is nasty to take in any form. 
The dogs are the hardest to manage. I kick one in the head, throw a, another one off the battlements. Amelia is down. She bites a dog in the neck and punches it till it whimpers off. Mustang tackles someone off the battlements. I slide tackle one of the archers as he levels his bow at her. Outside, Pax shouts for me to open the gates. He's actually crying for combat. I follow Mustang down into their courtyard, jumping from the parapets down to where she fights a big Sari student. I end the boy with my elbow and take my first glimpse of the bread fortress. The castle is an unfamiliar design, a courtyard leading to several buildings and a huge keep where the bread bakes, making my stomach rumble, but all that matters to me is the gate. We rush to it, shouts from behind us, too many of us to fight. We get to the gate just as three dozen house Siri students run at us across the courtyard from their keep. Hurry, Mustang shouts, uh, hurry! Mil uh, Milia shoots arrows at the enemy from the parapets. Then I open the gate. Pax all Telemannus, Pax all Telemannus. He shoves me aside, his shirtless, massive, muscled, screaming. His hair is painted white and spiked with sap to form two horns. A piece of wood as long as my body curved at his club, as his club. Serves as his club, anyway. The house Harry students flinch back. Some fall, some stumble. A boy screams as Pax thunders close. Pax all Telemannus. Pax all Telemannus. He wants no nickname as he charges forward like a minotaur possessed. Then he hits the mass of house Harry students. It is ru ruin. Boys and girls fly through the air like chafe on reaping day. The rest of my army sprints in behind the mad bastard. They begin to howl, not because I told them to, not because they think that they are Severo's howlers, but because it was the sound they heard when my soldiers cut their way out of horses' bellies, the sound that made their hearts sink as they were conquered. Now it's their turn to howl as they turn the battle into a mad melee. Pax screams his name and he screams mine as he conquers the citadel almost single-handedly. He picks a boy up by the leg and uses him as a club. Mustang drifts about the battlefield like some Valkyrie, enslaving those who lie stunned on the ground. In five minutes, the ovens and citadel are ours. We shut their gates, howl, and eat some bread. I free the house Diana slaves who helped me capture the fortress and take a moment with each to share a laugh. Tacta sits on some poor boy's back, braiding the prisoner's hair in girlish pigtails, till I nudge him to get off. He slaps at my hand. Don't touch me, he snaps. What did you say? I growl. He stands fast, his nose coming only... On, his nose... Wait. He stands fast, his nose coming only to my chin, and speaks very quietly so only we can hear. Listen, big man, I'm of the genes Vali. My pure blood goes back to the conquering. I could buy and sell you with a weekly allowance, so you don't demean me in this little game like all the others, your schoolyard, you schoolyard king. Then louder as so others can hear, I do as I like because I took this castle for you and slept in a dead horse so we could take Minerva. I deserve to have some fun. I lean close. Three pints. He rolled his eyes. Whatever are you growling about? That's how much blood I'm about to make you swallow. Well, might makes right, he chuckles and turns his back on me. Then, mastering my anger, I tell the members of my army that they will never be slaves in this game again, so long as they wear my wolf skin. If they don't like that notion, they can clear out. None do, but that's expected. They want to win, but to follow my orders, to understand that I don't think I'm some high and mighty emperor, their proud hearts need to feel valued. So I make sure they know they are. I pay each student a specific compliment, one they remember forever. Even when I am ruining their society at the vanguard of a billion screaming reds, they will tell their children that Darrow of Mars once clapped them on the shoulder and paid them a compliment. The defeated students from House Series watch me free my army's slaves and they gape. They don't understand. They recognize me, but they don't comprehend why there isn't a single other Mars student, or why I'm in power, or why I think it is allowed to, f it is allowed to free slaves. 
While they are still gaping, Mustang enslaves them with the symbol of House Minerva, and they become doubly confused. Win me a fortress and you get your freedom too, I tell them. Their bodies are different from ours, softer from much bread and little meat, but you must be starving for some venison and wild meat. Some protein is missing in your diets, I think. We brought plenty to share. We freed several slaves taken by House Ares months prior. There are few, but most are House Mars or Juno. They find this new alliance strange, but it's an easy pill to swallow after months of toiling in the ovens. The night ends on a sour note as I am woken an hour into sleep. Mustang sits on the edge of my bed as my eyes flutter open. When I see her, I feel a spike of terror in me, assuming she's come for a different reason, that her hand on my leg means something simple, something human. Instead, she brings me news I wish never to hear again. Tactus flouted my authority and tried to rape a Ceres slave during the night. Milia caught him and Mustang barely stopped her from cutting Tactus a thousand different ways. Everyone is up in arms. It's bad, Mustang says. The Diana students are in their war gear and are about to try to take him back from Milia and Pax. They're mad enough to fight Pax? Yeah, I'll get dressed, please. I meet her in the series war room two minutes later. The table is already carved with my sling blade. I didn't do it and it's much better work than I could have managed. Thoughts? I fall into the seat opposite Mustang. We're a council of two. It's times like this when I miss Cassius, Roke, Quinn, all of them, especially Severo. When Titus did this, you said we make our own law. If I remember right, you sentenced him to death. So are we still doing that, or are we doing something more convenient? She asked me as though she already thinks I'm letting Tactus off the hook. I nod, surprising her. He'll pay, I say. This, it just pisses me off. She takes her feet off the table and leans forward to shake her head. We're meant to be better than this. That's all peerless are supposed to be, transcendent of the urges that... She holds up ironic air quotes, enslave the weaker colors. It isn't about urges, I tap the table in frustration. It's about power. Tactus is of House Vali, Mustang exclaims. His family is ancient. How much power does he want? Power over me, I mean. I told him he couldn't do something. Now he's trying to prove he can do whatever he wants. So he's not another heathen like Titus. You've met him, of course he's a heathen, but no, this was tactical. Well, he has put you in a tight spot. I slap the table. I don't like this, someone else picking the battles or the battlefield, that's how we will lose. It's a no win, really. We can't come out ahead. Someone is going to hate you either way, so we just have to figure out which way is the least damaging, Prime. What about justice, I asked. Her eyebrows float upwards. What about winning? Isn't that what matters? You trying to trap me? She grins. Just testing you. I frown. Tactus killed Tamara, his primus. Cut her saddle and then rode over her. He's wicked. He deserves any punishment we give him. Mustang raises her eyebrows as if this is all to be expected. He sees what he wants and he takes it. How admirable, I mutter. She tilts her head at me, lively eyes going over my face. Rare. What's that? I was wrong about you. That's rare. Am I wrong about Tactus? I asked. Is he w wicked really? Or is he just ahead of the curve? Does he just grasp the game better? No one grasps the game. Mustang puts her muddy boots on the table again and leans back. Her golden hair falls past her shoulders in a long braid. The fire crackles in the hearth, her eyes dance over my face. I don't miss my old friends when she smiles like that. I ask her to explain. No one grasps the game because no one knows the rules. No one follows the same set of rules. It's like life. Some think honor universal. Some think law is binding. Others know better, but in the end, don't those who ride by poison die by poison? I shrug. In the storybooks, in life there's no one left to poison them, often. They expect an eye for an eye, the house series slaves. Punish Tactus, you piss off the Diana kids. 
They get you a fortress and you spit on them for it. Remember, as far as they are concerned, Tactus hid in a horse's belly half a day for you when you took my castle. Resentment will swell like a copper bureaucracy, but if you don't punish him, you'll lose all of Ceres. Can't do that, I sigh. I failed this test before. I put Titus to death and I thought I was metting out justice. I was wrong. Tactus is an iron gold. His blood is as old as the society. They look at compassion, at reform, as a disease. He is his family. He will not change. He will not learn. He believes in power. Other colors are not people to him. Lesser golds are not people to him. He is bound to his fate. Yet I'm a red acting like a gold. No man is bound to his fate. I can change him. I know I can. But how? What do you think I should do? I ask. Ha! The great reaper, she slaps her thigh. When have you ever cared what anyone thinks? You're not just anyone. She nods and after a moment speaks. I was once told a story by Pliny, my tutor, a ghastly fellow really, and a politico now, so take that all with a shipload of salt. Anyway, on earth there was a man and his camel. I laugh, she keeps going. They were traveling across this grand desert full of all sorts of nasties. One day as the man prepared camp, the camel kicked him for no reason, so the man whipped the camel. The camel's wounds grew infected. It died and left the man stranded. Hands, camels, you and metaphors. She shrugged. Without your army, you're a man stranded in the desert. So tread carefully, Reaper. I speak with Nyla, the Ceres girl, in private. She's a quiet one, smart as a whip, but not physical in any way. Like a shuddering songbird, like Leah. She has a bloody swollen lip. It makes me want to castrate Tactus. She didn't come in wicked like the rest. Then again, she got through the passage. He told me he wanted me to rub his shoulders, told me to do what he said because he was my master, because he spent blood taking the castle. Then he tried, well, you know. A hundred generations of men have used that inhuman logic. The sadness of her words create in me makes me miss home. But that happened there, too. I remember the screams that made the soup ladle tremble in my mother's hand. Remember how my cousin earned antibiotics from that gamma. Nyla blinks and stares for a moment at the floor. I told him I was Mustang's slave, House Minerva's. It's her standard. I didn't have to obey him. He just kept pushing me down. I screamed. He punched me. Then he just held my throat till things started to fade and I barely smelled his wolf cloak anymore. Then that tall girl, Milia, knocks him off, I guess. She didn't mention that there were other Diana soldiers in that room. Others watched. My army. I gave them power and this is how they use it. It's my fault. They are mine, but they are wicked. That will not be fixed by punishing one of them. They have to want to be good. What would you like for me to do to him? I ask her. I don't reach out to comfort her. She doesn't need it even though I think I do. She reminds me of Evie too. Nyla touches her dirty curls and shrugs. Nothing. Nothing isn't enough. To fix what he tried to do to me? To make it right? She shakes her head and her hands clutch her sides. Nothing is enough. The next morning I assemble my army in the Ceres Square. A dozen limp, few aureate bones can really be broken because of their strength. So most of the injuries suffered as the assault were superficial. I smell the resentment from Ceres students, from Diana students. It's a cancer that'll eat away at the body of this army, no matter who it is focused on. <laughs> Pax brings Tactus out and shoves him to his knees. I ask him if he tried to rape Nyla. Laws are silent in times of war, Tactus draws. Don't quote Cicero to me, I say. You are held to a higher standard than a marauding centurion. In that, you're hitting the mark at least. I am a superior creature descended from proud stock and glorious heritage. Might makes right, Darrow. If I can take, I may take. If I do take, I deserve to have. This is what peerless believe. The measure of a man is what he does when he has power, I say loudly. Just come off it, Reaper, Tactus replies. 
confident in himself as all like him are. She's a spoil of war. My power took her, and before the strong, the bend the weak. I'm stronger than you, Tactus, I say, so I can do with you as I wish, no? He's silent, realize he's fallen into a trap. You are from a superior family to mine, Tactus. My parents are dead. I am the sole member of my family, but I am a superior creature to you. He smirks at that. Do you disagree? I toss a knife at his feet and pull my own out. I beg you to voice your concerns. He does not pick his blade up. So by right of power, I can do with you as I like. I announce that rape will never be permitted, and then I ask Nyla the punishment she would give. As she told me before, she says she wants no punishment. I make sure they know this so there are no recriminations against her. Tactus and his armed supporters stare at her in surprise. They don't understand why she would not take vengeance, but that doesn't stop them from smiling wolfishly at one another, thinking their chief has dodged punishment. Then I speak. But I say you get 20 lashes from a leather switch, Tactus. You tried to take something beyond the bounds of the game. You gave in to your pathetic animal instincts. Here that is less forgivable than murder. I hope you feel shame when you look back at this moment 50 years from now and realize your weakness. I hope you fear your sons and daughters knowing what you did to a fellow gold. Until then, 20 lashes will serve. Some of the Diana soldiers step forward in anger, but Pax hefts his axe on his shoulder and they shrink back, glaring at me. They gave me a fortress and I'm going to whip their favorite warrior. I see my army dying as Mustang pulls off Tax's shirt. He stares at me like a snake. I know what evil thoughts he's thinking. I thought them of my floggers too. I whip him twenty brutal times holding nothing back. Blood runs down his back. Pax nearly has to hack down one of Diana's soldiers to keep them from charging to stop the punishment. Tactus barely manages to stagger to his feet, wrath burning in his eyes. A mistake, he whispers to me. Such a mistake. Then I surprise him. I shove the switch into his hand and bring him close by cupping my hand around the back of his head. You deserve to have your balls off, you selfish bastard, I whispered to him. This is my army, I say more loudly. This is my army. Its evils are mine as much as yours, as much as they are Tactus's. Every time any of you commit a crime like this, something gratuitous and perverse, you will own it and I will own it with you. Because when you do something wicked, it hurts all of us. Tactus stands there like a fool. He's confused. I shove him hard in the chest. He stumbles back. I follow him, shoving. What were you going to do? I push his hand holding the leather switch back toward his chest. I don't know what you mean, he murmurs as I shove him. Come on, man, you were going to shove your prick inside someone in my army. Why not whip me while you're at it? Why not hurt me, too? It'll be easier. Millia won't even try to stab you, I promise. I shove him again. He looks around. No one speaks. I strip off my shirt and get to my knees. The air is cold. Knees on stone and snow. My eyes lock with Mustang. She winks at me and I feel like I can do anything. I tell Tactus to give me 25 lashes. I've taken worse. His arms are weak and so it is his will to do it. It still stings, but I stand up after five lashes and give the lash to Pax. They start the count at six. Start over, I shout. A little rapist Kerr can't swing hard enough to hurt me. But Pax bloody well can. My army cries in protest. They don't understand. Golds don't do this. Golds don't sacrifice for one another. Leaders take. They do not give. My army cries out again. I ask them, how is this worse than the rape they will all be so comfortable with? Is not Nyla now one of us? Is she not part of the body? Like reds are. Like obsidians are. Like all the colors are. Pax tries to go light. But it's Pax, so when he's done... My back looks like chewed goat meat. I stand up, do everything I can to prevent myself from wobbling. I'm seeing stars. I want to wail, want to cry. Instead, I tell them that anyone who does anything vile, they know what I mean, 
will have to whip me like this in front of the entire army. I see how they look at Tactus now, how they look at Pax, how they look at my back. You do not follow me because I am the strongest. Pax is. You do not follow me because I am the brightest. Mustang is. You follow me because you do not know where you are going. I do. I motion Tactus to come toward me. He wavers, pale, confused as a newborn lamb. Fear marks his face, fear of the unknown. Fear of the pain I willingly bore. Fear when he realizes how different he is from me. Don't be afraid, I tell him. I pull him forward into a hug. We are blood brothers, you little shit. Blood brothers. I'm learning. End of chapter 36. Let me update our chapter words real quick guys if you haven't subscribed already to the channel please make sure you do so and give this video a like while you're at it that'll get us out there and seen by more people chapter 37 south I yelp as Mustang puts Sav on my back in the war room. She flicks my back with a finger. Why, I moan. The measure of a man is what he does when he has power, she laughs. You mock him for Cicero and then spit out Plato. Plato is older. He trumps Cicero. Ow! And what was that about blood brothers? That means absolutely nothing. You might as well have said you were pinecone cousins. Nothing binds like pain shared. Well, here's some more of that. She pulls a bit of leather out of a wound. I yelp. Pain shared, I shudder. Not inflicted. Psychotic. Ow! You sound like a girl. Thought martyrs were tough. Then again, you could be barking mad. Fever when you were stabbed properly. You traumatized Pax, by the way. He's crying. Good work. I actually hear Pax's sniffles from the armory. But it did work, eh? Sure, Messiah, you made yourself a cult, she mocks dryly. They're building idols to you in the square, kneeling in supplication of your wisdom. Oh, mighty Lord, I will laugh when they find out they don't like you and can have you flogged any time they do a naughty. Now hold still, you pixie, and stop talking, you annoy me. You know, when we graduate, maybe you should look into being a pink. Your touch is so tender. She smirks. Send me to a rose garden. Huh. Now that would tickle my father pink. Oh, stop squealing. The pun wasn't that bad. The next day, I organize my army. I give Mustang the duty of choosing six squads of three scouts each. I have 56 soldiers, more than half are slaves. I make her put a series in each group, the most ambitious. They get six out of the eight common units I found in Ceres War Room. The things are primitive, crackling earpieces, but they give my army something I've never had an evolution beyond smoke signals. So I'm assuming you have a plan besides just going south like some Mongol horde, Mustang says. Of course, we're going to find the House Apollo. True to my promise to Fitchner. The scouts strike out that night from House Ceres, fanning out in the south in six directions. My army follows at dawn just before the winter sun rises. I will not squander this opportunity. Winter has forced the houses into fortresses. Deep snow and hidden ravines make heavy cavalry sluggish, less useful. The game has slowed, but I won't. Mars and Jupiter can battle it out for all I care. I'll come back for both later. At nightfall on the second day of our move south, we see this fortress see the fortress of Juno, already conquered by Jupiter. It lies to the west on a tributary of the Argos. Mountains frame it. Beyond that are the wintry six kilometer high walls of the Val. Marineris. My scouts bring me news of three enemy scouts, cavalry, in the fringes of the woods to the east. They think it is Pluto, the jackal's men. The horses are back, and the hair of the riders is dyed the same. Oh, black. They wear bones in their hair. I hear that they rattle like bamboo wind chimes as they ride. Whoever the riders are, they never come close, never fall into my trap. 
A girl is said to lead them. She rides a silver horse draped with a leather mantle sewn with unbleached bones. Apparently, the medbots are not so good in the south. Lilith, I think. She and her scouts disappear south as a larger warband appears from the southeast and skirts along the Great Woods. These are now real armies of heavy horse. A single rider came forward from the larger warband. He carries the archer pennant of Apollo. His hair is long and unbraided, his face hard from the winter winds that roll in from the southern sea. A cut on his forehead nearly claimed both his eyes, eyes that stare now at me like two burning coals in a face of hammered bronze. I walk forward to meet him after telling my army to look as weathered and pathetic as humanly possible. Pax manages poorly. Mustang makes him go to his knees so he looks relatively normal. She stands on his shoulders for comic relief and starts a snowball fight as the emissary comes near. It's a rowdy, foolish affair and it makes my army look wonderfully vulnerable. I fake a limp. Toss away my wolf cloak, fake a shiver, make sure my pathetic durosteel sword looks more like a cane than a weapon. Bend my long body as he approaches and I spare a lock, look back at my playing army. My look of embarrassment is almost split in half with a laugh. I swallow it down. His voice is like steel dragged over rough stone. No humor to him, no recognition that we're all teenagers playing a game and that the real world still flows on outside this valley. In the south, things have happened to make them forget. So when I offer him a self-effacing smile, he does not return it. He is a man, not a boy. I think it is the first time I've ever seen someone fully transformed. And you are but a ragged remnant from the north, the Apollo Primus Nova scoffs. He tries guessing the house we hail from. I've made sure the Seri standard is the one he sees. His eyes flicker. He wants it for his own glory. He also happily notices that more than half of my army of 56 is enslaved. You will not last long in the South. Perhaps you would like shelter from the cold, warm food in bed. The South is harsh. I can't wager it will be worse than the North, man, I say. They have razors and pulse armor there. Proctors turn their favor from us. They are not there to favor you, weakling, he says. They help those who help themselves. We helped ourselves as best we could, I say meekly. He spits on the ground. Little child, do not whine here. The South does not listen to tears. But, but the South cannot be worse than the North, I shudder and tell him of the reaper from the highlands, a monster, a brute, a killer, evil, evil things. He nods when I speak of the reaper, so he has heard of me. The reaper of yours is dead, a shame. I would have liked to test myself against him. He was a demon, I protest. We have our own demons here, a one-eyed monster in the woods and a worse monster in the mountains to the west, the jackal. He confides as he continues with his pitch. I would be allowed to join Apollo as a mercenary, not a slave, never a slave. He would help me defeat the Jackal, then retake the North. We would be allies. He thinks me weak and stupid. I look at my ring. The Proctor of Apollo will know what I say here. I want him to know I am going to ruin his house. If he wants to try to stop me, this is his invitation. No, I say to Novus, my family would shame me. I would be nothing to them if I joined you. No, I'm sorry. I smile inside. We have enough food to march through your lands. If you let us, we will brook no. He slaps me across the face. You are a pixie, he says. Stiffen your quivering lip. You embarrass your color. He leans towards me over his saddle pommel. You were caught between giants and you will be crushed. But make a man of yourself before you... We come for you. I do not fight children. It is then that Mustang throws a snowball at his head. Naturally, her aim is true and her laugh is loud. Novus does not react. All that moves is his horse beneath him as it wheels to take him back to his roving warband. I watch the man go and feel disquiet seeping into me. Ride on home, little archer, Tactus calls out. Ride home to your mommy. Novus rejoins his sturdy, heavy horse. Our own cavalry is more is our scouts. Our only cavalry is our scouts. 
They cannot stand against iron blades and iron lances at full tilt, even with the deep snow bakes to muddle the heavier horses. Our weapons are still duro steel, armor no better than duro plate or wolf skin. I don't even wear armor. I don't plan on fighting a battle where I need to, need to for a while. We've not had a bounty after capturing Ceres Fortress and their standard. The proctors have forsaken me, but the weather has not. Normally infantry falls like dry wheat to cavalry, but the snow and its treacherous depths protect us. We camp on the western bank of the river that night nearer the mountains, away from the open plains in front of the dark great woods. Apollo's heavy cavalry now has to cross the frozen river in the darkness if they want to raid our camp as we sleep. I knew they'd try when they thought us weak, ripe for the picking. They fail miserably. Arrogance. As dust settles, I had Pax and his strongmen take axes out to soften the thick ice of the river bordering our camp. We hear horses' screams and plunging bodies in the night. Medbots wind down to save lives. Those boys and girls are out of the game. We continue south, aiming for where my scouts guess Apollo's castle lies. At night, we eat well. Soups are made from the meat and bones of animals my scouts bring back. Bread is kept stored in the makeshift packs. It is the food that keeps my army content. As the great Corsican once said, an army marches on its stomach. Then again, he didn't fare so well in the winter. Mustang walks beside me as I lead the column. Though she's swaddled with wolf cloaks so as thick as my own, she hardly comes up to my shoulder. And when we walk through deep snow, it's almost a laugh to see her try to keep pace with me. But if I slow, I earn a scowl. Her braid bounces as she keeps up. When we reach easier ground, she glances over at me. Severe thunder. <laughs> her pert nose is red as a cherry in the cold, but her eyes look like hot honey. You haven't been sleeping well, she says. When do I ever? When you slept next to me. You cried out the first week in the woods. After that, you slept like a little baby. Is this you inviting me back? I asked. I never told you to leave. She waits. So why did you? You distract me, I say. She laughs lightly before drifting back to walk beside Pax. I'm left confused both by my response and by her words. I never thought she'd care one way or the other if I left. A stupid smile spreads on my face. Tactus catches it. Smitten as a lovebird, he hums. I hurl a handful of snow at his head. Not a word more. But I need another word, a serious word. He steps closer, taking a deep breath. Does the pain in your back give you... Um... Wait, does the pain in your back give you... Hmm, like it gives me, he laughs. Are you ever serious? His sharp eyes sparkle. Oh, you don't want me serious. How about obedient? He claps his hands together. Well, you know I'm not prime fond of the idea of a leash. Do you see a leash? I ask, pointing to his forehead, where his slave mark could be. And since you know I don't need a leash, it may do to tell me where we are bound. I would be more effective that way. He's not challenging me because he speaks quietly. After the whipping we both received, he's taken to me in a frighteningly loyal way. Despite all the smiles and sneers and laughs, I have his obedience, and his question is sincere. We're going to ruin Apollo, I tell him. But why Apollo, he asked. Are we merely checking off the houses at random, or should I know something? The tone in his voice makes me cock my head. He's always reminding me of some kind of giant cat. Maybe it's the frighteningly casual way in which he lopes along, like he'd kill something without even tensing his muscles. Or maybe it's because I can imagine him coiling up on a couch and licking himself clean. I've seen things in the snow, Reaper, he says quietly. Impressions in the snow, to be specific. All these impressions are not made by feet. Pause, hooves. No, dear leader, he steps closer. Linear impressions. I get his meaning. Grab boots flying very low. Do tell me, why are the proctors following us? And why are they wearing ghost cloaks? All his whispers mean nothing because of our rings. Yet he doesn't know that. Because they are afraid of us, I tell him. Afraid of you, you mean, he watches me. What do you know that I don't? 
What do you tell Mustang that you don't tell us? You want to know, Tactus? I've not forgotten his crimes, but I take his shoulder and bring him close like he's a brother. I know the power touch can have. Then knock House Apollo off the gory damn map, and I will tell you. His lips curl into a feral smile. A pleasure, good reaper. We stay away from the open plains and cling to the river as we move farther south, listening to our scouts relay news of enemy holdings over the comms. Apollo seems to control everything. All we see of the jackal are his small bands of scouts. There's something strange about his soldiers, something that chills the heart. For the thousandth time, I think of my enemy. What makes the faceless boy so frightening? Is he tall, lean, thick, fast, ugly? And what gives him his reputation, his name? No one seems to know. The Pluto scouts never come near despite the temptation we offer them. I have packs carry the banner of Ceres High so that every Apollo cavalryman in the surrounding miles can see it glimmer. Each realizes the chance for glory. Parties of cavalry dash into us. Scouts think they can pry our pride away and gain themselves status in their house. They come stupidly in threes and fours, and we ruin them with the Ceres archers or Minervan spearmen or with buried pikes in the snow. Little by little, we gnaw at them as the wolf gnaws at the elk. Always we let them escape, though. I want them angry as hell when I arrive on their doorstep. Slaves like them would slow us down. That night, Pax and Mustang sit with me by a small fire and tell me of their lives outside the school. Pax is a riot when you get him going, a surprisingly energetic talker with a penchant for complimenting everything in his stories, including the villains, so half the time you don't know who is good and who is bad. He tells us of a time he broke his father's scepter in half, and another time he was mistaken for an obsidian and nearly shipped off to the Agoge, um, where they train in space combat. A notion you could say I always dreamt of being an obsidian, he rumbles. When he was a boy, he would sneak from his family's summer manor in New Zealand Earth and join the obsidians as they performed the Nagoj, the nightly necessities of their training in which they looted and stole in order to supplement the paltry diet they were given at the Agoj. Agoj? Agoj? It's gotta be Agoj. He would scrap and fight with them for morsels of food. He says he would always win, that is, until he met Helga. Mustang and I lock eyes and try not to bust out with laughs as he waxes grand grandiloquent on Helga's ample proportions, her thick fist, her ample thighs. Theirs was a large love, I tell Mustang. A love to shake the earth, she replies. I'm woken the next morning by Tactus. His eyes are cold as the dawns freeze. Our horses have decided to run away, all of them. He guides us to the series boys and girls who are watching the horses. None of them saw a thing. One minute the horses were there, the next they were gone. Poor horses must be confused, Peck says sorrowfully. It was stormy last night. Perhaps they ran for safety to the woods. Mustang holds up the ropes that held the horses during the night, pulled in half. Stronger than they look, he says dubiously. Tactus, I nod my head to the scene. He looks over at Pax and Mustang before answering. There are foot tracks. But? Why waste my breath, he shrugs. You know what I'm going to say. Proctors pulled the ropes apart. I do not tell my army what happened, but rumors spread quickly when people huddled together for warmth. Mustang does not ask questions, even though she knows I'm not telling her something. After all, I did not simply find the medicine I gave her in the North Woods. I try to look at this newest kink as a test. When the rebellion begins, things like this will happen. How do I react? Breathe the anger out, breathe it out, and move. Easier said than done for me. We move to the woods to the east. Without horses, we've no more play to make in the plains near the river. My scouts tell me the castle of Apollo is near. How will I take it without horses, without any element of speed? As night falls, another kink reveals itself. The soup pots we brought from Ceres to cook over our fires are cracked through, all of them, 
and the bread which we kept so securely wrapped in paper in our packs is full of weevils. They crunch like juicy seeds as I eat a supper of bread. To the drafters it will look an unfortunate turn of events, but I know it is something more. The proctors warn me to turn back. Why did Cassius betray you? Mustang asked me the night as we sleep in a hollow beneath a snowdrift. Our Diana sentries watch the camp's perimeter from the trees. Don't lie to me. I betrayed him, actually, I say. I... It was his brother that I had to kill in the passage. Her eyes widen, and after a moment she nods. I had a brother die. It's not... It wasn't the same thing, but... A death like that, it changes things. Did it change you? No, she says as though she just realized it, but it changed my family, made them into people I didn't, I don't recognize sometimes. That's life, I suppose. She pulls back suddenly. Why did you tell Cassius that you killed his brother? Are you that mad, Reaper? I didn't tell him slag. The proctors did through the jackal. Gave him a hollow cube. I see his eyes go... Her eyes go cold, so they are cheating for the arch governor's son. I leave her in the warmth of the fire to piss in the woods. The air is cold and crisp. Owls hoot in the branches, making me feel watched in the night. Darrow, Mustang says from the darkness, I will about. Mustang, did you follow me? Darrow, not Reaper. Something is amiss. Something in the way she says my name, that she says my name at all. It's like seeing a cat bark, but I can't see her in the darkness. I thought I saw something, she says, still in shadow, voice emanating from the deeper woods. It's just over here. It'll blow your mind. Ah, oh, Darrow, come on now. I follow the sound of her voice. Mustang, don't leave the camp. Mustang! We've already left it, darling. Around me the trees stretch ominously upward. Their branches reach for me. The woods are silent, dark. This is a trap. It is not Mustang. The proctors, the jackal, someone watches me. When something watches you and you don't know where it is, there's only one sensible thing to do. Change the paradigm. Try to even the playing field. Make it have to look for you. I break into movement. I sprint back toward my army. Then I dash behind a tree, scramble up it and wait, watching. Knives out, ready to throw cloak curled around me. Silence. Then the snapping of twigs. Something moves through the woods. Something huge. Pax, I call down. No response. Then I feel a strong hand touch my shoulder. The branch I crouch in sinks with the new weight as a man deactivates his ghost cloak and appears from thin air. I've seen him before. His curly blonde hair is cut tight to his head and frames his dusky godlike face. His chin is carved from marble and his eyes twinkle evilly, bright as the armor. Proctor Apollo. The huge thing moves again below us. Darrow, 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 he clucks over at me in Mustang's voice. You were a favorite puppet, but you're not dancing as you ought. Will you reform and go north? I refuse no matter. He shoves me off the branch hard. I hit another on the way down, fall into the snow. I smell dander, fur, and then the beast roars. And that's where we're going to call it for this week, guys. Evidently, he's not playing by the rules, so Darrow's about to have to fight this creature that Apollo has turned loose on him. But, guys, thank you so much for hanging out this week. Please make sure you comment your thoughts on this book so far and how you think things are going and what you think is going to wrap up in the end. Also, don't forget, we're in the last hundred or so pages, so that means we need your suggestions for the next book. We need the choosing to be ready to go. So if you have a book that you would like us to read on the live show, put it in the comments or in the chat, and we will get those in there for possible uh, candidates of books for the choosing. And you'll learn more about the choosing as we get closer and closer to it. Guys, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, like all the videos that you watch, and um, turn on your notifications so that you're notified when we go live and when we um, have our videos, which we do daily. Right now, we're doing two videos a day, so we're getting a lot put out there right now. 
If you would like to support us, you could do so in two ways. Go to patreon.com slash bearded book club and you could be a wonderful, wonderful patron like MC, Be A Light Productions, Keith, Jamie, Caitlin, and Melissa Parrish at Country Financial Insurance. Guys, you can also go down in the description of this video and um, go to our Amazon wish list and you can send us a book as a one-time donation. If you send us a book in one way or another, whether it's live in these shows, or um, on a series like we do on the day to day, it will get read one way or the other. So thank you guys so much for considering supporting us in that way. Oh man, trying to get the the green screen not to freak out on me on the very end here. But until then, guys, we'll see you next week live for real, hopefully. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Please comment. Please keep subscribing. Tell your friends about us. We're watching this channel grow, and we're, we're having a blast doing it. We hope you are as well. Um, so let us know, and we want to keep doing things that you guys like. Thank you so much for your continued support, and we'll see you next week. Until then, bookworms, make sure you read something, because reading is good for you. God bless you guys.